This was barrier buster Jackie Robinson in 1947, the first Negro to break into baseball's major leagues. Robinson began his career as a first baseman for the Brooklyn Dodgers, but he was to make his mark as a great second baseman and carve a niche for himself in our sports history. Jackie Robinson was a fierce competitor on field and off. His foes swore at him, his friends swore by him. All of his life when he swung, he swung for keeps. In 1949, he won the Most Valuable Player Award and led the Dodgers to the National League pennant. That same year, he appeared before the House Un-American Activities Committee to castigate an allegation that Negroes would never fight communism because of America's racial prejudices. In true Robinson fashion, he took on not only the communists, but also Jim Crow. Teammates Don Newcomb and Roy Campanello followed Robinson's path and they too bore out the vision and wisdom of Dodger President Branch Rickey. A man's merit, not his color, had become the important factor in Major League Baseball. I hope that your work this coming season will be such that you will uh, even merit a, uh, even a better contract than this one. Well, thank you very much, Ricky, Mr. Rickey. I'm certainly pleased with the contract, and that last little bit you said, I hope to do it <laughs> as well as last year, get a better contract. Thank you very much. Robinson once described himself as a one-woman man looking for a one-man woman. Well, he found her in his Rachel, Rachel Robinson. They were married in 1946. Before he reached Ebbets Field, Robinson's destiny took him from his humble birthplace in Georgia all the way to California and football fame. Wherever it took him, he played the game right up to the hilt. He aggravated many, but he also made teeming thousands of friends, including Gil Hodges. Through good fortune and adversity, Jackie's tremendous drive kept him surging ahead. Some baseball experts swore that not since Ty Cobb had they seen such a daring base runner as Robinson. Jackie retired in 1955, but fans still remember his great fielding, his flashing bat, and his great base running. This was an athlete that no fan could be lukewarm about, for Jackie Robinson was never half committed about anything himself. That was barrier-busting Jackie Robinson. Maggio came off the sandlots of San Francisco to blast his way into baseball's Hall of Fame and capture the imagination of all America. Joe McCarthy, the great Yankee manager, helped his bashful rookie. I think that you should tell some of these boys that may be listening what you had to do to reach the major league as a player? Well, in answer to Mr. McCarthy's question, I would say for a young ball player to do is uh, take quite a bit of advice from the older folks. And that way I mean try to learn the finer points of the game and to be a clean liver and to swing that butt hard when you see that ball on top of you. Joe connects to follow his own advice. He was a magnificent center fielder, a superb base runner, and he knew how to hit the dirt. Joe became a glittering star among stars, outshining even such teammates as Lou Gehrig, Tommy Henrik, Bill Dickey, Joe Gordon. DiMaggio gripped his bat at its very end and swung for distance. His 361 Major League home runs justified his nickname, the Yankee Clipper. Joe's big league batting average was 325. He hit safely in 56 consecutive games. And three times, with the approval of the fans, he was voted the league's most valuable player. Even his failures were colossal. Joe belted one in the 1947 World Series, 
It looked like a surefire home run. But Dodger outfielder Al Gianfrido made one of the most miraculous catches in series history. After Army service, DiMaggio returned to the Yankees, plagued by old injuries. But manager Casey Stengel's faith in the Clipper was to pay off. DiMaggio Day came to the stadium in 1949. Thousands honored the fisherman's son who, despite constant pain, hung on that season and batted an astounding 346. Then in 1951, Joe bowed out of the game. His presence had enriched on and off the field. When baseball is no longer fun, it's no longer a game. And so, I played my last game of ball. The grace, power, and style of Joe DiMaggio is unforgettable. His Yankee number five can be worn no more, for it hangs in baseball's Hall of Fame forever. in the slums of Baltimore. He came to baseball out of St. Mary's Industrial School for underprivileged boys. First with Baltimore and then with the Boston Red Sox, he starred as a pitcher. He hurled a record 29 consecutive innings in World Series play before he emerged as baseball's greatest slugger. Babe Ruth's love of children was monumental. There was something about the huge homely image of the babe that evoked warmth and a joy of life. He had a St. Bernard's tenderness, beautiful in its awkward innocence. He caught the imagination of fans everywhere. No one was lukewarm about the babe. He amassed more records than any other man in the annals of baseball. The great Bambino was sold to the New York Yankees in 1920 for what was then a record price. Under Miller Huggins, pitcher Ruth became a full-time outfielder. And the rest, as they say, is history. They clouded 714 home runs just like this in 21 years of matchless play. In 1927, Babe blasted 60 home runs and was officially crowned Sultan of Swat. He was an all-round athlete of sorts and could clown with the best of them. His zest and popularity carried him on to Hollywood even where his appearance, while posing no threat whatever to Valentino or Barrymore, drew a long line of loyal fans at the box office. Babe retired from baseball in 1934. He transferred his great slugging power to a gentler sport. His coordination, considering his unathletic torso and spindly legs, was just awesome. Watch this putt. In 1948, gravely ill with cancer, Ruth returned to the Yankee Stadium, the arena that is his monument. Leaders from every walk of life came to honor him and remember fondly the babe of old the immortal number three. The babe died soon after that. His name is forever enshrined in baseball's Hall of Fame at Cooperstown, New York. Hard as a bat, soft as a glove, that was Babe Ruth. literally blasted his way across America's fairways to become one of golf's all-time greats. Then in 1949, at the very peak of his career, he suffered a near-fatal auto accident. The medical verdict was a harsh one. Hogan was lost to golf. He would never walk again. But one year after that verdict, Ben Hogan strode through the grueling U.S. Open Championship, culminating a miraculous comeback. 
Watch him now as he sinks the final putt to regain his Open Championship. If Mrs. Hogan was proud, the sports world was astounded. Hogan next turned his eye toward the Masters, the only major U.S. tournament he had never won. Starting out in the last round of the 1951 Masters, one stroke behind Ski Regal and Sam Snead, Hogan thrilled the crowd of 10,000 with fairway splitting shots and brilliant putting. Meanwhile, Regal had come in with a par busting 282. The crowd was tense. Could Hogan top that? He could and he did. Here he sinks his final putt for a shattering 280. The tenacious Hogan was congratulated by Bob Jones, who witnessed this expansion of his comeback. In the Open Championship of 1953, crowds again saw Ben at his very best. Hard luck was stalking Sam Sneed. His chip was in and then it was out as he tried to overtake Ben. Climaxing a frustrating final round, Sneed saw his putt miss by an eyelash. Phantom Ben, blazing home in championship style, rammed his shot to within six feet of the cup from the final hole. Relaxed and confident, Hogan holed out the champion, third man in golfing history to win the Open four times. His score was six strokes ahead of Sneed, who foiled in his 13th attempt to capture the crown, was a good-natured runner-up to battling Ben Hogan. A month later in the British Open, Frank Stranahan was the man to beat as Ben belted out a long one on Scotland's ancient Carnoustie course. Stranahan, capping a determined closing rally, drops a chip shot for a sparkling second place finish. Hogan reached the final green in two. His first putt just missed. But the icy nerve Texan, who had overcome overwhelming odds before, came through again to record a magnificent new chapter in his comeback career. He had won the British Open on his very first try with a blistering 282. This was the little man with the gigantic spirit, winner of Galton's most coveted crowns, sports immortal Ben Hogan. August 6, 1926, a 19-year-old Amazon from America challenged the dangerous waters of the English Channel. Gertrude Adderley waited with youthful confidence as Greece was applied to protect her and provide warmth against those icy waters. With the handshakes of well-wishers and the last few words of advice from her coach, Gertrude Adderley began that torturous journey through freezing waters and heavy undertows. This young girl had a date with destiny that few men swimmers were ever able to keep. Hour after hour, she fought against winds and currents that ripped across the channel. From the open boat that guided her the 22 miles to France came words of encouragement. Trudy had attempted to swim the channel the year before, but had been pulled out of the water exhausted before she could make shore. now recorded for the waiting world a young girl's heroic story of daring and courage. Without touching the boat, which would have meant disqualification for her, Miss Adderley ate especially prepared foods to build up her energy. Giant ocean tugs towered above the small figure in the water. On and on she swam. The goal became nearer and nearer. Could she achieve what no other woman had ever been able to do before? Mounting waves threatened to bash her against the flotilla of accompanying boats. Fighting against wind and rip tides, Gertrude Adderley was facing one of the roughest tests of human endurance but she would not give up. And then she touched shore. Gertrude Adderley had become the first woman ever to swim the English Channel. Her time, 14 hours and 31 minutes. New York rolled out its best red carpet for the biggest ticker tape parade of the times. Thousands and thousands cheered welcome to the nation's reigning queen. Go 
Wilbur Whalen, New York's dapper official greeter, rode with Miss Edley as the huge crowds surged forward for a glimpse of the girl who had made good. 1926, incidentally, was also the year of the first telephone calls from New York to London and the first talking movie, Don Juan. But Trudy Edley's first was the feat about which the public of the 20s was most excited. At City Hall, a cheering tribute echoed through the streets of Lower Manhattan. The celebration was hosted by Mayor Jimmy Walker as Gertrude Edley achieved her great moment of glory and her fate with destiny. racing crowns for 15 years with dazzling horsemanship. Here he is atop Zell in the great match race against In Memoriam in 1923. Around the turn, In Memoriam is in the lead. Now watch as Sandy makes his move to record one of his memorable victories. Sandy had far to go, and he did. In 1930, racing fans were to see one of the most thrilling preaknesses ever run at Pimlico. That's Sandy up on Gallant Fox. The competition was top caliber. The tension, well, that was fit to explode. And they're off. The pack thunders by like something out of Tennyson's Light Brigade. maneuvers the immortal gallant fox through the deadly gaps between thousands of pounds of straining horse flesh. Neck and neck with front-running cracked brigade, Sandy makes his good second move and wins by a length. In 3,663 races between 1918 and 1932, Earl Sandy finished in the winner's circle or in the money two-thirds of the time. Belmont Park, scene of Sandy's last race before his formal retirement in 1932. Sandy aboard Osmond was out to take one of the turf's top events, the Belmont Futurity. And there they go. This view of Belmont shows one of Sandy's favorite stretches. race of his fabulous career. But the proud record book on Earl Sandy was not closed. Hard times, hard luck led him back to the saddle. In 1953, at the age of 54, Sandy tried a comeback. At Belmont Park once again, riding Honest Brad, handy little Sandy proved he could still finish in the money. Sandy, old enough now for a rocking chair, but finishing third, immortal and ageless, ever to be remembered in horse racing's Hall of Fame. The driving force behind yesteryear's college football resurgence was the unforgettable Newt Rockney. Rockney was born in Norway in 1888. His family migrated to Illinois when he was five years old. The University of Notre Dame was his springboard to sports immortality. National fame first came to Rockney in 1913, when as captain and end of the Fighting Irish, an underrated team, he forged the neglected forward pass into a lethal weapon and sensationally upset powerful army. After his graduation from Notre Dame the following year, Rockney became assistant football coach. He held that post until 1918 when he became head coach. Now with his new free reign, he revolutionized football and brought to it a popularity it had never known before.
Barkley developed some of the greatest backfields in history. He became a powerful influence on the lives of thousands of young men on and off the campus. Everywhere Newt Rockney went, he drew crowds of admiring fans. The entire nation seemingly had gone football crazy. In Rock's 13 years as head coach, Notre Dame teams won 105 games, lost only 12, and tied five. At the left of the scene is another great coach, Frank Leahy, who was to carve a coaching career of eminence of his own at Boston College in Notre Dame. Rockney's famous pep talks inspired his teams to score a total of 2,857 points, more than four times that of all competitors combined. Private counsel was a firm Rockney tradition. He believed that only true individuals could make up a good working team. By drilling his squads relentlessly, he instilled in them a vital creed. His voice would come booming across the gridiron. Go, go, go. In his off moments of relaxation, Rockney often played ball at home with his young son. Here the same creed applied. If you fall down, get up and go. Rockney often appeared with his daughter, who obviously made her dad as proud of her as he was of his great team. But in 1931, at the crest of his fame, Rockney was killed in a plane crash. He was only 43 years old. The rock of Notre Dame had crumbled, but his memory will never die. He could knock out a giant or quote Shakespeare with equal ease. He was christened James Joseph Tunney in 1898, but came to fame as Gene, the fighting leatherneck. Tunney won the light heavyweight championship of America's overseas forces in World War I, and returned to the United States to win that division's world title. Later in this heavyweight bout with Tommy Gibbons, the handsome ex-Marine blasted his way into top contention for the heavyweight crown. Watch as in slow motion, Tunney, a superb boxer, also reveals his great punching power. Discipline, training, and ceaseless determination combined with high intelligence and a strong body made Gene Tunney one of the most formidable fighting machines in ring history. It was all over for Gibbons, but just the beginning for Tunney. Now nothing stood between Tunney and the coveted heavyweight title, but the great champion himself, Jack Dempsey. Tunney again went into vigorous training, and again it was to pay off. He defeated the powerful Manasseh Mahler twice, once for the crown and once in defense of it, to emerge undisputed heavyweight king. Few champions were more popular, but even champions meet their match, as when Tunney ran into this 35 pounds of dedicated and ferocious muscle. Though heavyweights were usually Tunney's victims, flea weights were always his conquerors. If there was any chink in the champion's armor, it was his susceptibility to a youngster. This was Gene Tunney's return to his native New York after winning the heavyweight title. Colorful Mayor Jimmy Walker joins in the wild hometown salute. In 1928, Tunney retired undefeated and rose with equal success in society and business. Although Tunney had been a calculating tiger inside the ring, he was instinctively a gentleman outside of it. I just want to congratulate Roxy on this marvelous turnout tonight. Uh, I uh, anticipate a very lovely show. 
and uh, from all reports I get, uh, it's going to be uh, first class. Speak softly and carry a big punch. Gene Tunney did both nobly.